Welcome back to The Bumbling Blogger, I'm Alice and today I'm going to be judging books by their first pages. So we have a lot of books, you can see that just from the shelves behind us, but we have a massive stack on our fireplace that we call the read then go pile and it basically means that eventually we will read those books and then we'll probably donate them because they aren't the kind of books that we think we're gonna love, uh, we don't like the edition that we've got because it's in bad condition, reasons like that. We haven't really been focusing on that pile much this year so it stayed a bit stagnant and a few of the books I was thinking of getting rid of them before picking them up but I thought instead I'd read the first page and if any of them grab me they can go back on the pile and I'll try and prioritise them as soon as possible and if any of them I'm really bored just by the end of the first page then they can go. I have picked off 15 books for you today, I don't know how long it's going to take me because I don't know how many words are on each first page so I will just kind of do as many as I feel like until I get bored but if you enjoy this video and you would like part two of it please let me know down in the comments because as I said we've got hundreds of books in this stack so it will not be hard to pick out another five or ten to do another video like this in the future. So without further ado let's judge some books by their first pages. I'm a bit nervous about this because I don't like unhauling things. We did a huge unhaul a few weeks ago and I find it so difficult to get rid of books and that's why I thought this way we're trying a little bit of them and hopefully I'll get the feeling of whether I'll like it or not. It's gonna be hard. <laughs> So the first book that we are judging today is A Little Friendly Advice by Siobhan Vivian. Now I'm not going to read out the blurb, I'm not going to look at the blurb because then I might get tempted by the rest of the story later on. I'm just going to read the first page to you and then make a decision. If you disagree with any of my choices or you've read any of these books and you love them but you think the first page doesn't represent them well, please let me know again down in the comments because I won't be getting rid of them straight away. I will be saving them up for a little while so that I can unhaul a bunch of books together again so you can rescue these if you need to. Please do, because I hate getting rid of things. <laughs> so without further ado, page one. The wrapping paper on my birthday present is impenetrable. Mum must have used half a roll of tape to secure the sharp folds, creases, and delicate trimmings just so. She wants my sweet 16 to be special, more special than me wearing a Hanes undershirt, Levi's, and my dirty pair of Converse in our cramped mustard yellow kitchen. I bet you can't even fit into that pretty sundress I bought you in August, Mum taunted when she realised I was dead serious about not dressing up for dinner. You've shot up at least three more inches since then. It was endearingly pathetic, so I put on a foil party crown. Mum cooked her homemade ziti, got me a whale-shaped ice cream cake with chocolate crunches from the carvel across town, and invited my friends over at nine to help me buy out the candles. Once we're all tweaked out on sugar, we're going to bail on Mum for some suburban debauchery in my honour. Even though it's Thursday, I'm allowed out until midnight. I'm interested enough to see what's going on that I will keep this one because it's quite obviously her birthday and she's going to get up to some wild times with her friend. I also like gift wrapping so I relate to her mum and a whale shaped ice cream cake just sounds amazing. So this one seems promising, I'm not turned off by it so this one can stay. Book number two is Fly on the Wall by Elock Hart. This is an ex-library copy, so it's really beat up. <laughs> oh, part one is called Life as an Artificial Redhead, which I like the title. Friday. I am eating alone in the lunchroom. Again. Ever since Katja started smoking cigarettes, she's hanging out back by the garbage cans, lighting up with the art wraps. She bags her lunch, so she takes it out there and eats potato chips in a haze of nicotine. I hate smoking and the art rats make me nervous, so here I am, in my favourite corner of the lunchroom, sitting on the floor with my back against the wall. I'm eating fries off a tray and drawing my own stuff. Not anything for class. Quadriceps, quadriceps, knee, calf muscle, dull point, must sharpen pencil. Hell, pencil dust in fries, whatever, they still taste okay. Calf muscle, ankle, foot, kapow! Spider-Man smacks Dr. Octopus off the edge of the building with a swift kick to the jaw. Ock's face contorts as he falls backward, his metal tentacles flailing with hysterical fear. He has an 80-storey fall beneath him and Spidey has a great physique. Built, but not too built. Even if I did draw him myself. This one is so much better than the first one, but I'm now thinking <laughs> the first one wasn't actually that interesting. This is much better. I like the quick pace of the storytelling style. I love the fact that she's doing comic book illustrations. That's really cool. And also, like, that's really pacey. So if the rest of the book keeps up that pace and... The end of this book is actually a sample of the next one. Yeah, this is less than 200 pages. 
This one's definitely staying. The next one is Gone by Min Kim. Um, as far as I'm aware, this is a memoir. So we do have quite a mixture going on in here. I probably should have said that earlier. We've got some thrillers, we've got some YA, we've got some non -fic. So hopefully something for everybody and hopefully at least something that I will properly fall in love with because that the fly on the wall sounds really, really good. Okay. This is Gone, a girl, a violin, a life unstrung. See, this is what I was worried about how long this was gonna take me because this is just one paragraph. <laughs> I've been dreaming about my violin. I am waiting to board an aeroplane, maybe flying to a concert, maybe flying away for one. It's hard to say. I am alone. Maybe I should be with my mother or my old tutor. It's hard to say. My violin is with me, but the woman at the check-in says it has to go down into the hold. I don't want it to go into the hold. It's never been put there before, but those are the airline's rules. Or is it that I have not filled out a form properly? I have the feeling that it could all be my fault. I lift the case up and place the violin on the conveyor belt. The woman ties a label to the handle, presses her foot to start the conveyor belt motor. The violin gives a little start as if it's been pushed in the back, something it won't have liked, and then starts to be carried away, slowly disappearing through the rubber flats. Do I see it tip up as it reaches the end, as if it's fallen off a cliff? I can't quite make it out, but in that instance, something tells me I will never see my violin again. A little time later, I am in the plane, or maybe I am out of the plane. We have flown, or we have landed, or something has happened to cause us to disembark. That's it. Something has happened to cause us to disembark. Everyone is happy that they are safe, but I know that something terrible has happened. No one will say what but something terrible has happened. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> um, I'm not a huge fan of the, it's kind of a very block text. There's quite a lot of repetition in there, but it certainly gets the point across. She is dreaming about her violin. It is going missing. And the whole story is about this violin being missing and the fact that she's trying to find it. So it, it certainly gets straight to the point. So that one will also stay. I'm not going to end up unhauling any of these, which is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> the next one is Haunt Me by Liz Kessler. And the main reason I've been keeping this one, well, two reasons. One, my friend won this at Yelk and gave it to me because it's signed and she read it and she didn't like it. So the reasons I want to keep it, it was a gift and it's signed. The reasons I don't want to keep it, one of my best friends hated it and I trust her opinion. So this one might be interesting. Oh, it also has a poem at the beginning, but we'll just dive straight in to page one. Oh, Joe. What the hell? I sound like a gunshot pierces my dream and I'm bolt upright, shaking, wide awake. I look down at my body. I seem to be intact. No blood. A quick glance around the room. It's dark. My bedroom door is closed. Did I shut it last night? Maybe I forgot. That'll have been it then. The sound, it was just the door. Something shut in the wind. Must have left the window open too. I squint at the window. It's closed. The curtains aren't moving. There's no wind, no draught. In fact, as my eyes adjust, I notice there's nothing. I mean, nothing at all. Zip. I'm lying on the floor. Where's my bed? Where's my wardrobe, my desk, my clothes strewn across the carpet thrown off when I went to bed last night? I try to remember getting into bed. Can't. I must have been out of it. My body's aching all over. Not surprising after a night sleeping on the floor. Well, where's all of his stuff gone? <laughs> I want to know. Oh, God. That's a good opener. You can't tell me that's not a good opener. A guy's like, hey, I've just woken up. There's been a gunshot. Oh, where's all my stuff? I'm interested. Yeah, why not? Keep that one as well. Book number five, The New Girl by Ingrid Alexandra. Prologue. 20th of August, 2016, 4.17am. The smell of blood lingers. It's on my clothes, though they have been washed clean. On my skin, though I've scrubbed it raw. Light is shining through a crack in the door. The yolk orange glow steals across the bedroom like an intruder, illuminating the white pinstriped shirt that hangs from the clothes horse. The empty sleeves dangle, twitching now and then in the breeze from the room. I tune my ears to the sounds in the next room. He's pacing, thinking. Mary, he mutters. Mary, Mary. As I curl against the cold wall, my skin tingles with adrenaline. He always said I couldn't be trusted. Yeah, okay, this one stays too. Ah, oh, <laughs> I thought this was going to be such a great way to get rid of things. I'm trying to be picky as well. Oh. But like, why is he pacing? Why can't he trust her? Why does she smell of blood? I'll find out. 
Book number six is Not That Kind of Girl by Siobhan Vivian, another Siobhan Vivian book. I bought these because I liked the kind of design where it's got like the accent colour on the front is the colour on the back and then the colour on the spine is like the accent on the back. I think those are cute but I bought three or four of these and I've never read any of them so I mean I'm still interested in a little friendly advice at least. There you go, prologue. On the first day of my senior year, I happened to walk past the auditorium during the freshman orientation assembly. One of the two heavy oak doors, each with the Ross Academy crest inset in stained glass, had been propped open. There were only enough students inside to occupy the first few rows of stiff, uncomfortable seats, and the emptiness gave the place a hollow sound that surely made the freshmen feel even smaller and more overwhelmed. I had a free period and a hall pass, so I ducked inside for old time's sake. It took all of three minutes before I wanted to scream. Freshman orientation is a colossal waste of time, or at least the way our school handles it, forcing new students to sit through a word-for-word -word recitation of the Ross Academy handbook performed in a monotone by the guidance counsellor nearest to death. There weren't many do's in the Ross Academy handbook. That, that one bores me. Just start it off with the handbook. Like, if that had been, like, a Ross Academy handbook, like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, and then it had dived into the story, I would have been a bit more interested. But just, oh yeah, they're telling them to have the handbook and the handbook's pretty boring. Like, well, that makes this book feel pretty boring. So, this one's going to go. We've unhauled one book so far. That's good. One out of six. It's not bad. The next book is Paperweight by Meg Haston. I love, again, I love the cover of this one, but I know it's about, it's either anorexia or bulimia, it's eating disorder and sometimes I'm not in a good place and I find these very triggering so I've been putting off and putting it off but I'm in a good place at the moment so I might as well read the first page and then either flee or read it as soon as possible before I get into a bad place again. <laughs> Day 1. Friday, July the 4th, 1.34pm. 27 days to freedom and I am caged. Suspended in a boxy aluminium prison with grey cloth seats and the synthetic stench of pina colada swinging from the rear view. Josh, sorry, Joshua, would say I'm being a drama queen. I imagine him saying things like that sometimes. It's not like I can actually hear his words out loud, or he comes to me in my dreams or some bullshit like that. But if I'm really still, I can almost hear him. The closer I get to the anniversary, the more I'm trying. I pretend that he's next to me on our rotted wool balcony before dawn, when my shallow breath is the only sound. I conjure him up in the middle of the night and he's sitting next to the bed when I'm dizzy and sick with Eden and booze. I imagine him rubbing my back in easy circles, whispering these sweet French lullabies our mother used to sing. I can almost feel the warmth of his hand. I wish he were here now, to calm me. Yeah, okay, that one's good. That one's good, because, like, you've got the fact that she's lost her brother. Brother? Yeah, definitely a brother. Yeah, our mother. So she's lost her brother and she's also in a treatment centre of something. So that definitely interests me. There's a lot going on in here. I've heard people compare this to Girl in Pieces by Kathleen Glasgow and I really loved that book. But this also sounds very promising so far. So this one will stay. Book number eight. Wow, we're getting through these quickly. I thought this was going to take ages. This is Pushing the Limits by Katie McGarry. Heard other things about heard good things about some of her other books but I've never picked one up and also I got this one for like a pound in the work so I wasn't going to say no Echo My father is a control freak I hate my stepmother My brother is dead and my mother has, well, issues How do you think I'm doing? That's how I would have loved to respond to Mrs Collins' question but my father placed too much importance on appearance for me to answer honestly Instead, I blinked three times and said Fine Mrs Collins, Eastwick High's new clinical social worker, acted as if I hadn't spoken. She shoved a stack of files to the side of her already cluttered desk and flipped through various papers. My new therapist hummed when she found my three-inch thick file and rewarded herself with a sip of coffee, leaving bright red lipstick on the curb of the mug. The stench of cheap coffee and freshly sharpened pencils hung in the air. My father checked his watch from the chair to my right, and on the left, the wicked witch of the west shifted impatiently. I was missing my first period calculus, my father was missing some very important meeting, and my stepmother from Oz... I'm sure she was missing her brain. Yeah. Yeah, this one's good. Like, you start off and you've got a lot of different things introduced, like the fact that her mother's dead and she doesn't go on with her stepmother. Like, there's a lot of tension in a very short period of time. And the fact that she also has to kind of fake 
her emotions to please her father. Uh, definitely going to be a lot about parental expectations in this one, I'm guessing. So definitely going to be keeping that one. That's a really strong starter. The next one's another memoir. This is Irredeemable, a memoir of darkness and hope by Erwin James. All my life I had been a liar, a thief and a cheat. Now I had to face the rest of my life as a convicted murderer. Standing in the dock of court number one at the Old Bailey listening to Mr Justice Otten deliver his judgement was my darkest moment. I tried to keep my head up and hold the judge's gaze as he spoke until he described me as brutal, vicious and callous. Then I lowered my eyes. When he finished I took a deep breath and glanced around one last time at the courtroom full of strangers, all there because of me and my co-accused. Flanked and separated by prison guards, he and I never once acknowledged each other in the dock. He blamed me for our crimes. I denied any involvement. We were both lying. In the crowded court, a small group of people sitting near the end of the lawyer's bench far to my right stood out. I'd noticed them coming and going on different days of the trial, and it struck me that they did not appear to be part of the official proceedings, neither were they with the press. Eventually, it dawned on me that they were connected in some way to our victims, family or friends, perhaps. I avoided looking in their direction. Their dignified conduct served only to intensify my shame. Yeah! damn like ad admitting that you're flawed but then you're not that flawed but then also saying like oh i'm we both lied in court well what was the truth then that makes me want to know Ooh, ooh. okay yeah oh this one oh i really like that definitely staying the next one, trying not to judge the book by its author, because I've heard some pretty controversial things about Jamie Maguire. I've owned a lot of her books because I've just like picked them up in the works over the years. This one I found in a charity shop for 50p and it's brand new condition. So I'm trying not to judge it too harshly based off of that. It's Red Hill by Jamie Maguire. And let's see if the first chapter per page is any good. Scarlet. The warning was short, said almost in passing. The cadavers were herded and destroyed. The radio hosts then made a few jokes, and that was the end of it. It took me a moment to process what the newswoman had said through the speakers of my suburban. Finally. A scientist in Zurich had finally succeeded in creating something that, until then, had only been fictional. For years, against every code of ethics known to science, Elias Klein had tried and failed to reanimate a corpse. Once the leader amid the most intelligent in the world, he was now a laughing stock. But on that day, he would have been a criminal, if he weren't already dead. At the time, I was watching my girls arguing in the back seat through the rear view mirror, and the two words that should have changed everything barely registered. Two words, had I not been reminding Hallie to give her field trip permission slip to her teacher, would have made me drive away from the curb with my foot grinding the gas pedal to the floorboard. Okay, so it's going to be zombies. And it's a mother. And I kind of thought Jamie McGuire only wrote romances, so I'm now mildly intrigued. But does it just mean that it's going to be a romance at the end of the world? Because I'm not into that. I might give this one like a few chapters. I'm not excited about it. It doesn't make me convinced. Like if I'd read that before I bought it, I probably would have just put it back on the shelf. But it doesn't make me want to get rid of it straight away. Yeah, I'll do a couple chapters and then possibly skip. We then have Safe Haven by Nicholas Sparks. So this actually should be a romance because I've read Nicholas Sparks before and I know that he just does romances with like kind of bittersweet twists. So let's try this one. As Katie wound her way among the tables, a breeze from the Atlantic ruffled through her hair. Carrying three plates in her left hand and another in her right, she wore jeans and a t-shirt that read Ivan's. Try our fish just for the halibut. She brought the plates to four men wearing polo shirts, the one closest to her caught her eye and smiled. Though he tried to act as though he was just a friendly guy, she knew he was watching her as she walked away. Melody had mentioned the men had come from Wilmington and were scouting locations for a movie. After retrieving a pitcher of sweet tea, she refilled their glasses before returning to the waitress station. She stole a glance at the view. It was late April, the temperature hovering just around perfect, and blue skies stretched to the horizon. Beyond her, the intracostal was calm despite the breeze and seemed to mirror the colour of the sky. A dozen seagulls perched on the railing, waiting to dart beneath the tables if someone dropped a scrap of food. Ivan Smith, the owner, hated them. He called them rats with wings, and he'd already patrolled the railing, twice wielding a wooden plunger, trying to scare them off. Yeah? 
interesting enough, like nice setting. Doesn't really do anything either way, but it's not making me want to get rid of it. Like, it's kind of comforting and beachy. Could be fun to read in the summer. Yeah. I I just like keeping books too much and I can always justify keeping books and it's a problem. <laughs> so we've only got four books left, so I might as well finish my stack of 15 that I had gathered. Because this is actually going way quicker than I thought it would. But also I've only managed to get rid of one book so far. I want to get rid of at least two before this video finishes because otherwise <laughs> it's a bit of a waste of time. Uh. So the next one we have is Texas Gothic by Rosemary Clement Moore. Which is dusty as heck. Oh no. Chapter 1. The goat was in the tree again. I hadn't even known goats could climb trees. I had been livestock sitting for three days before I'd figured out how the darned things kept getting out of their pen. Then one day I'd glanced out an upstairs window and seen Taco and Gordita, the ringleaders of the herd, trip, trip, tripping onto one of the low branches extending over the fence that separated their enclosure from the yard about Aunt Hyacinth's, around Aunt Hyacinth's century-old farmhouse. Don't even think about it, I told Gordita now, facing her across that same fence. <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing it's not very representative of <laughs> what is going on in the story. Because you can't escape your inner witch. Gothic. Goats. Bit of a... Bit of a strange opener. Not what I was expecting. Um, I think I'm going to go with no for this one. Um, I love goats. And I knew they could climb, so I didn't learn anything. Um, but I'm just not sure, because it doesn't really give you much of a feeling of the story. So I'm going to say no, but if anybody's read this one, please tell me if it gets better. Because I was really, really interested in this one. The next one we've got to do is Too Far by Jason Starr. Nice little rhyme there. Too Far, Jason Starr. Chapter 1. In the two bedroom penthouse on 73rd, near 3rd, Rob McAvoy said, I like it, man, I like it. Then as he went ahead through the short foyer into the kitchen area, he added, Breakfast bar, love it. What kind of word? Teak, I said. Sweet. It's sold a few months ago by the owner, I added, countertops, blue louise, that's top of the line granite, and those all new appliances, sub-zero wolf, with a fully integrated dishwasher. Rob was walking away until the living room asking if fireplace work? Yeah, and you don't see many apartments with working fireplaces in Manhattan. Living room's kind of small. Yeah, I said, but there's a separate dining area and an open floor plan with lots of lighting to exposures. Southern? Nah. I don't know why, but like, I mean, I don't like the fact that on the opposite page, there's like one of the um, quotes at the beginning of the book, epigraphs, and it says there is nothing safe about sex, there never will be. Uh, so I will admit that I am kind of a bit apprehensive based off of that, but also I'm not a huge fan of a lot of dialogue right at the beginning because it doesn't really give a sense of character and it's like very flat like even the kind of attributions around that is like I added he walked away but then there isn't really any kind of sense of what tone they're using there's no sense of like whether they're getting on or not it doesn't give us anything about either of our characters and it's very dry so that one can go We've then got Two Summers by Amy Friedman, which I've picked up upside down because it's like, what? Uh, oh, shit. does that mean it's like a backwards-forwards one? It's not. It's not. I've just seen the last sentence. <laughs> oh, no. But it's fine because I'm judging by the first page, not by how it ends. Even if I do know how it ends now, and I'm not that interested. Prologue. Monday, July 3rd, 7.37pm. I will admit I do like ones that, like, give you a date and a time. It's really easy to, like, get yourself into it. <laughs> One one thousand, two one thousand. I stared down at the clock on my phone, silently counting the seconds until seven thirty-seven p.m. becomes seven thirty-eight p.m. My heartbeat seems to tick in equal rhythm. Ten one thousand, eleven one thousand. Summer, 
stop it or does my best friend read the sting i look over at her even though her dark brown eyes are on the road she can guess what i'm doing obsessing over the time won't get us there any faster she tells me i know that i protest my cheeks hot i shift in the passenger seat and transfer my phone from one crammy palm to the other 22 1000 23 1000 the thing is i wish i could control time slow it down speed it up bend it to my will to me minutes and hours are slippery fickle things for most of sophomore year which ended just last week i showed up to school late and breathless but on those rare occasions I was invited to some Saturday night party, I arrived dorkily early. I can't win. That is how you do dialogue at the start of a story, right? Because it gives you a sense of their relationship, it gives you a lot of history between the characters, and it gives you the emotion that the character is feeling. That is a much more interesting opener. I'm interested in the idea where it's like two summers. Um, I think it's kind of like sliding doors in like it's like a decision is made and then it could go either way so i like the way it's already mentioning time that early and how she would like to control time definitely makes me think there's gonna be a lot of interesting time wimey stuff in this story let's try it I'm meant to be judging it just solely based off the first page but like with the context for that one i like it and then the last one we're going to do today is vivian versus the apocalypse by katie coyle this has another name in america um Vivian Apple at the end of the universe, I think. So you might recognise the cover and not the title, but it is the same thing. Uh, so this is a prologue. The Book of Frick, 513. There came a time when the American people began to forget God. They turned away from his churches and grew arrogant and stupid. God needed a prophet and he cho chose a man called Beaten Frick. Frick was pure of heart and mighty of resources. He lived in a kingdom called Florida. The angels appeared to Frick and said, build a church in your name and tell America the good news. God loves them best and will welcome them into the kingdom of heaven when the time comes. Frick did as the angels instructed, but the American people did not listen. They fornicated and listened to rap music instead. God was made angry at this and he himself appeared to Frick, saying, you have done as I asked and shall be rewarded as will those who follow. But as America has turned from me, so I shall turn from them. Let the blessed be taken into heaven and the rest suffer torment until the world finally ends. So God let America go and temperatures rose and tornadoes ripped apart the heartlands based off of that i'm guessing it's going to be like a um rapture kind of dealio and although i don't think i've read anything rapturey in ya like specifically rapturey I've got enough books about the rapture, like The Leftovers, I haven't read that yet. There was another one I'm trying to think of off the top of my head that I can't remember. But I've got a few on my TBR already that I'm more interested in. This is probably the hardest one. I do know it's part of a series and I don't have the next one. So that inclines me to get rid of that also a lot of YA books with cults or the idea of like intense religion end up disappointing me so I'm not completely sure on that either yeah I'm gonna get rid of that one that one's gonna go because I mostly just got it because I liked the title and the cover and I didn't realise it was going to be intensely religious. I've now seen on the back that it literally says, Vivian Apple never believed in the Church of America, unlike her fanatical parents. And as for the so-called impending rapture, she knew she'd believe that when she saw it. I should have read the blurb, but I literally... They, they were 10p each when I used to work at the library. All of the withdrawn books like 10p each, so I did not say no, and I should have. So this one will go. But that means we managed to get rid of four books today, and I'm about to throw them all over the floor for you, so that'd be fun. Getting rid of four books today, so we're getting rid of Vivian vs. The Apocalypse, Not That Kind of Girl, Texas Gothic, and Too Far. So if you've read any of these and would recommend them, and you think I'm judging them too harshly off of their first page, then please do let me know. And we are keeping Two Summers by Amy Friedman, Safe Haven by Nicholas Sparks, Red Hill by Jamie Maguire, Redeemable by Owen James, Pushing the Limits by Katie McGarry, Paperweight by Meg Haston, The New Girl by Ingrid Alexandra, Haunt Me by Liz Kessler, Gone by Min Kim, Fly on the Wall by E. Lockhart, and A Little Friend of the Pikes by Sean Vivian. So, again, if you've read any of these and you think I'm being far too generous with their first page, please do let me know, and that might make me get rid of them, because I feel like you watch me, because we have similar reading tastes, so you can help me out now. 
but yes thank you for watching this video i hope that you enjoyed this concept again if you would like me to do a part two to this then please let me know because this has been a lot of fun and it was a lot quicker than i thought it was going to be we post new videos every tuesday thursday and saturday so if you'd love to subscribe and get more content from us regularly we would be super duper grateful for that and thank you for all of the people who have already subscribed to our channel it really does mean so much to us we'll see you again in a couple of days bye